You know, it's really a great honor to be here. I was so blessed for Joan to ask me to come to be a part of this gathering. And I think, I think I've only been to Dothan, Alabama one other time. I think I was here a few years ago when Bill Johnson would come uh, here into the city, I think maybe every year. I don't even know if he still does that or not. But, but before he was famous, actually, I think he was coming. And so I, I, there was a group of people that asked me, would you go with us to see, to see Bill? And I said, well, yeah. So we came, and you know, that was my, one, my, was my one time in Dothan, Alabama. And so whenever uh, Joan asked if we would come, if I would come and be a part of this, I said, yeah, that'd be great. I'd, I'd love to go back and just see what God's doing in that particular part of, the re- of, of our nation. How many of you God still got a plan for America? I mean, in spite of everything that's trying to destroy it, God has still got a plan, and he's still listening to the cries of his people. And I believe that we will see, I, I believe we will see a, disciples, a discipling of nations. I just, I believe that. That's my, that's my whole contention. I always tell people, I said, if your eschatology doesn't leave room for the reformation of nations, you need to get a new eschatology. I lost most of you right there, but... <laughs> Eschatology just simply means a, a belief in the end times, you, the way you think things are going to pan out. See, most of us have been taught that the devil is just going to take everything over. Well, I got news for you. You go over and read Daniel chapter 7, verse 26. Well, if you start at verse 25, it starts talking about what it's actually describing there is the spirit of the Antichrist, which is honestly what we're contending against. See, what is the, I don't know why I'm getting into all this here, but here's what the Antichrist does. Go read Psalms 2. Psalms 2 describes the Antichrist. It says they will, it says they say we will cast off his bonds and remove his cards. In other words, we will remove the influence of God from culture. That's what, that's what, that's what that spirit says. And that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to completely remove, because in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it says that this Antichrist spirit, he intends to change times and laws. He has some intentions, but just because he intends to do something doesn't mean he's going to get it done. Because if you keep reading what it says, it says in the court, which I'm going to get into, the court shall be seated and it will take away his dominion. And it literally says that the saints who have been given under his, uh, that that antichrist spirit under his authority for time and times and half a time, it literally says that they shall be made the rulers. And so one decision from the court of heaven literally moved the saints from a place of defeat to a place of dominion. That's, that's the power of the court of heaven to move us into a place of absolute dominion so that the will and the intent of God can be done within even our nation and even our cultures. Amen? So listen, we just need to be contending for that. But I'm going to talk to you about the court of heaven tonight. I'm going to try to do something introductory. Anybody in the room heard any of my teachings on the court of heaven? Oh, okay. Well, I'm not completely unknown. Okay. That, that's awesome because, because what I want to do is I want to try to give you an understanding. Now, this, this principle changed my life. I mean, I have been a man of prayer since 1980. When I was, when I, not when I was called, I, was, I knew I was called to the ministry when I was a 12-year-old boy. Uh, and that was super with me. I mean, I was so hungry for God. We'd come out of the, the, the denominational church and into the things of the Spirit in the charismatic movement and all that kind of thing. I mean, we were in a little town. I mean, y'all think Dothan's small. Man, y'all grew up in a place called Grosbeck, Texas that had 2,500 people in it. And, and, and so we didn't know anything that was going on in the world other than what Walter Cronkite told us. See, some of y'all old enough to remember this. Okay, uh, some of you saying, who's Walter Cron- Cronkite? But anyway, um, uh, but so, so we, 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 uh, we're just a little bit of town. All of a sudden, my dad, my dad decides he doesn't, he's not going to go to church anymore. Now, we were church-going people. We were Church of Christ. Y'all know Church of Christ? Um, okay, no, I don't want to be negative or mean or critical, but, but I'm going to tell you, I would get up in the morning on Sunday hoping I was sick because I knew that was the only thing that was going to get me out of going to church. I knew that. I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. I would literally go to get up thinking, oh, I, would put my, I would put my forehead in the winter by the butane heater. Again, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. By the butane heater, I'd let it heat my forehead up, and then I'd go tell my mom, I think I got a fever. 
And she would say, go get your clothes on, you're going to church. And so, you know, I mean, I always tell people, when I was growing up, I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church every time the doors were open. And that's absolutely true. So we, we, would, we, would, we were in church every time, but I hated every minute of it, detested it, detested it. But then my dad got so hungry for God that he quit going to church and he would sit up two nights a week and read the Bible and, and still go to work, I mean, st- all, all night long, read the Bible, sleep one, and still work all day. And after about a month, I don't really know how long, I'll say about a month of doing this, he looks at my mother and he says to her, after just having read the Bible, he looks at her and he says, I'm going to go find me a Pentecostal church. Now, if you know anything about the church of Christ, that's about as far away as you can get from a Pentecostal church. And so my dad was getting a revelation of the move of God, of the power of God, of the life of God, and knew nothing about what was going on in the rest of the world in the charismatic renewal and movement. And, and so my mom said when he told her that, she thought, he's going to start raving mad. He's crazy. Well, what we didn't know was that my, bro- my, my sister and her husband who had married, whose brother, my, my brother-in-law's brother, was a Baptist pastor. We didn't know he had gotten so hungry for God after years of being a, a Baptist pastor that he had said to God, if, he said, if this is all there is, I can't do this anymore. He didn't mean he didn't love God and wasn't going to follow God. He meant I can't do ministry anymore. And, and, and because he was so hungry for God, he went into a, a garage to get his car fixed, and a man walks up to him and starts witnessing to him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, my, and, and his name is, I mean, James Walker is the man I'm talking about, and, and he said, James Walker said, he thought, this guy's crazy, but he said in less than a week, he was hunting for him trying to find that man. Long story short, he got filled with the Holy Spirit. My sister and brother-in-law had then started going to his church because he got kicked out of his Baptist church. Because he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not because he went in and talked about it. Rumors started, started filtering through and he ended up out and, and all this kind of. Well, my sister and brother-in-law were going to church. We didn't know this because they were afraid to tell anybody. And so when my dad said, I'm going to find me a Pentecostal church, my brother-in-law and sister said, well, if that's what you're feeling, you need to come go with us. So we ended up driving an hour from Grosbeck, Texas to Waco, Texas, so, yeah, probably about an hour. And we would drive over there. And I remember the first time as a 12-year-old boy, I walked in that room. I mean, you got to understand, I'm, I'm used to going to a church that has no life in it whatsoever. And we walked in the room. And, and there's, there's an organ. Back in the, this is, this is in the uh, you know, early 70s. There's an organ playing. There's a dr- set of drums. Somebody's playing the drums. Everybody in the room's got a tambourine. Oh, it was crazy. I mean, I don't know. How, I don't know how they could keep a beat on that platform, because everybody. I mean, they were going after that tambourine. I mean, it's and the, and the ones that were really were that were you know really uh, could keep rhythm. They were dancing with them, and so so all this is going on. But I'm, here's what the presence of God was in the place. And I'll never forget, I mean, long story short, I got touched by God. My life was never the same. At 12 years old, this is true, at 12 years old, I would watch my dad, who had gotten spirit-filled, prophesy in the services. I would watch other people prophesy. And at 12 years old, I remember I got prayed for, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, spoken to and I wanted to prophesy. So I said, Lord, I want to prophesy. And so what I would do that literally in those days, we would, start, we would start just moving into the things of the Spirit. The Spirit would start moving, whatever. And I'm a 12-year-old boy. I'm sitting in, this, in the seat, and I think about this now, and I'm thinking, God, I don't know whether I'd let that go on as a minister or not. And I'm sitting in the seat, and as I'm sitting in the seat, the Lord would give me a word. Now, you got to understand, I didn't even know the Bible. And I would prophesy the pastor's message before he preached it at 12 years old. And, and so there was, and, and so it became very well known. There's, there's something on that kid. 
There's something on that kid. And I knew I was called to the ministry. I knew that. And so what happened was that really was on my life until I was 16 years old. Well, at 16 years old, my affections kind of turned in another direction. At 16 years old, I'm a junior in high school, and I meet, or I already knew her, but I meet this beautiful young thing. She's been my wife for 45 years. Because we got together when we were juniors in high school. So we started dating, and all of a sudden, I didn't want to be in ministry anymore. I'm looking at the crowd here, see who I'm talking to. So what happened was we got married right out of high school. We we're 18 years old. I mean, good Lord. We, I mean, we, we, got, when we, got, we graduated in May, got married in August. Somebody says, why in the world would somebody get married at 18 years old? Well, very simple. Very simple. We wanted to have sex and not go to hell. <laughs> why else does an 18-year-old get married? Come on, you got to be real about this thing. <laughs> because, because, I mean, we got married, because, I mean, we were Christians. We understood. I mean, it was like, this is not, the, we got to do it the right way. So anyway, we got married at 18 years old. And, 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 and so I'd known I was called since I was 12. But then about, we'd been married for about two or three years. And we were actually, I mean, we didn't, we didn't go to school. We went, got, you know, we got, got jobs and all this kind of stuff. And, and I, was, I was just miserable. And, and so I decided, you know, I loved athletics and played sports in school and all this kind of stuff. And so we just decided I, we would both go to school. We didn't have any kids yet. We would both go to school. And when those kids started coming, that changed everything. But anyway... We didn't have any kids yet, so we, we, we thought, we'll just go to school. I was, going to be go, I was going to go get a degree and become a coach and all that kind of stuff. Well, right, right about that time, I get in a car, and I'm driving to the grocery store to get some bread and milk. And, you know, back in those, I had, and I had a 1973 Monte Carlo. Now, y'all see, see I'm, look, I'm looking at the age that I was here. And I, I know, it was a white 1973 Monte Carlo with glass packed exhaust we had put on it. We had turned a single exhaust into a dual exhaust. And they both, and they had glass back. And so whenever you went down the road, road and you let off the gas, you know, everybody knew you was coming. And everybody had it. Anybody that could do it had it. So we had that. So I'm driving down the road, this country road, this, this, this Red Rock road, going to the highway to turn and go about a minute's drive up to the store. I mean, that's just what, what I mean, I do it, did it many times a day. And I'm driving, and I probably got it on. We're living in Grosbeck, Texas. I'm 40 minutes outside of Waco, Texas. So we probably had it on the radio station of WACO, which was the AM station that paid, played the pop, pop of the day. You know, the Eagles, the Beatles, Elton John. Yeah, y'all know these people. So I'm probably listening to all these people. I know I am. I mean, I'm just listening to them. And all of a sudden, without warning... And everybody says, God is a gentleman, baloney. All of a sudden, without warning and without invitation from me, God enters my car. And I know it's God. I mean, I've known, known him since I was 12. I know his presence. He comes into my car, and I hear these words. The time is drawing nigh for you to do my work. That's, I mean, I heard it, and I said to the Lord, when he, when he said this to me, I said, but why now, Lord? Because at that point, I had a house, I had car, I had wife, we'd, we'd had our first son, he was two months old. All these things, I, I, I had all these responsibilities. And I thought, why now, Lord? How am I going to do this with all these responsibilities? And the Lord instantly said to me, because now you got to trust me. Without hesitation, even stronger than the first word. Well, I mean, I won't go into everything, but the bottom line is God dealt with my heart over the next couple of weeks, and I surrendered, and I said yes. But here's what I knew. I knew that what I was being called to was not just to preach, because quite honestly, I couldn't have preached my way out of a wet paper bag. 
I mean, getting up before people and speaking was a very difficult thing for me. But I knew I was being called to that. But I also knew more than anything I was being called to a life of prayer. And so I started out about that time trying to learn how to pray. And I would go in and I would shut my door of the bedroom. And I would start praying. And I would be dedicated and committed to praying for an hour. And I would think, surely it's been 45 minutes. And I would look at my watch, it had been seven. I mean, it was the hard, probably the hardest thing I ever had to learn to do was to cultivate a prayer life. But then all of a sudden, as I just stayed after it and stayed after it and stayed after it, something began to break and the presence of God started coming. And God just, just started visiting me in those times. So I became a man of prayer in 1980. And I prayed for decade after decade after decade. My, I mean, my prayer life gave birth to all sorts of things, all sorts of aspects of blessings over our life, over our family, over the ministry, all sorts of things that I was dedicated to. But then all of a sudden I hit this spot in about 2006, probably about 2009, 2008, 2009. You know, by now I've been praying for 20, what would be 26 or 29 years, 28, 29 years, just seeking God's face. I mean, just my wife told me, she said, I don't think anybody prays more than you do. That's what she told me one time. I said, oh, yeah, they do. She said, not in this culture they don't. Because I was, a, I mean, I knew. See, see, I always felt like I was a one talented person. And I thought, if I'm going to be able to do this, it's only going to be because it's going to come out of the strength and the empowerment of God. So that drove me out of necessity to seek his face and to find his presence. And so we saw great breakthroughs, but then all of a sudden, it seemed like my prayers didn't work anymore. Our kids started making awful decisions. They're grown now. We still got, we, at this point, we had one that was probably a junior. The other was probably a, 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 a freshman in high school, but all the rest of them are quote unquote grown. Or like I like to say, of legal age. There is a difference. And so they're all, and they start making terrible decisions. And, I, and at one point it was like me and Mary thought, we must, we must be the worst plant parents on the planet. How can our kids be turning out like this? We've raised them in church. We, they, I mean, what we were at home is what we were at church. There was no difference at all. There was no double standards. Why are our kids doing this? And they started making wrong. But all of a sudden, attacks started coming against my reputation out of the clear blue. I mean, just you pretty well name it, it started happening. And the problem was one thing would start, and, and before I could get it solved, another thing would pile on top, and then another thing would pile on top, and then another thing would pile on top, and then another thing would pile on top. Pile on top and, and I didn't know what to do. Everything was falling to pieces and I couldn't get it to stop. About that time, I got invited to go to South Africa. And so I went to Dr. C. Peter Wagner because I didn't really know these people that were inviting me and the last thing I wanted to do was get on an airplane and fly halfway around the world to a bunch of weirdos. I mean, I'm weird enough, but... but you know, I knew there was people more weird than me. And so I, I went to him and he said, yeah, you ought to go. You should go. I said, okay. I said, if that's what you think, I'll go. So I, I, I agreed to come. And so I get to South Africa. And when I get to South Africa, the lady that's running this ministry looks at me and she says these words to me. She says, Robert, now we're so happy you're here. But she said, here's what I want to do. She said, I want to, we want to cleanse your bloodline. And when she said those words to me, I said to her, what's wrong with my bloodline? I mean, I didn't mean it arrogantly. I just didn't know what she's talking about. She said, oh, you don't understand. She said, when you step on my platform, there are going to be people from all across the continent of Africa. And they're going to be from many different countries. And if there's anything in your bloodline, in your ancestral history that gives the enemy a legal right to come after you, those principalities from those countries are going to come after you and your family. And when she said this to me, this was the first thought that went through my head. 
I've got American demons after me. I don't need African ones too. That is honest to goodness, the first thought. And, and so I said to her, yes, please cleanse my bloodline. So they took me into a room with about four ladies. And they began to lead me in a prayer. Lord, I open my bloodline up. I ask if there's any issue in my bloodline, in my ancestry that is giving the enemy a legal right to come and bring destruction into my life, I'm asking that you would unveil it by your Holy Spirit. I just begin to pray that prayer. There's a little seer gift there named Katie that I didn't know her. She didn't know me, but she's phenomenal. Probably the most prophetic person I've ever met in my life. And she said, as they're praying, she says, Okay, some, I see that someone in Robert's bloodline in his ancestral history, they, they made a covenant with a demon god named Parax. And even the women that worked with this lady said, what are you talking about? She said, I see it. She said, she said there's a demon god that a covenant was made with, and they said, spell it. And she said, P-A-R-A-X. And when she, she spelt it, they pulled out the computer and they Googled Parax. Well, to everyone's amazement in the room, it came up a demonic God whose chief characteristic is to suck dry. The moment they said that, you know the cartoons where the light bulb comes on the top of the, the character's head? That's what happened to me. The moment they said that, I suddenly understood. The reason everything is falling to pieces of my, and I'm under attack after attack after attack on every level and in every way you could possibly imagine, the reason that's happening is because somebody made a covenant with a demon god in my ancestral history, and that thing is claiming a legal right to come now and destroy me. I just instantly understood that. So they led me in a real simple prayer that I renounce that. I renounce any covenant with that. I claim and declare that I am bought by the blood of Jesus and that any claim this thing has, I renounce it and watch it. And I give back to this thing anything it says I would have gained from it. Because the reason my ancestors would have made a covenant was because they might have needed rain in season. Or they might have needed blessings on their crops. Or they might have needed protection from an enemy. So, listen, they would make covenants with these demon gods. And they, that would give them the right to say, I own you and your lineage for generations to come. And so I prayed. I said, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. And I ask for you to forgive my ancestors. And I ask for your precious blood to speak for me according to Hebrews 11, 20, or 12, 24. And I prayed this prayer, and I renounced, and I asked for the blood, and I asked for a judgment from the court of heaven. I'd never heard of such. I asked for a judgment from the court of heaven against this demonic thing that, that his, his legal claim against me would be severed, and his, his rights would be revoked, and he would no longer be. As God is my witness, at that moment, everything shifted. And all the sucking dry stopped. And we entered into a massive time of, of uh, restoration that we walked through for many years after that. God just restoring, 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 restoring everything that had been lost. Plus more. That's what he always does. Plus more. And so he began to take me through that process. Well, I came home from South Africa. And I began to study, and it was like a spirit of revelation came, and God started showing me the courts of heaven. So because in South Africa, they didn't teach on anything. They were just doing this stuff. So I went back. They said, we want you to come back. So I went back to South Africa, uh, probably within three or four months. I went back to South Africa, and when I, I thought, what am I going to tell these people? Because quite honestly, when I was in South Africa with this particular group, it was like I'm in over my head. These people know stuff I do not know. And there's very few spiritual atmospheres I've been in where I felt that way. But I felt that way, and I'm thinking, I'm the inferior here. You're the superior. I don't know why you want me to teach you something because you guys know stuff I don't know. But they wanted me to come teach. And I'll tell you, I felt intimidated. 
So I just thought, well, what am I going to, what, what in the world am I going to tell these people? So I go back and, well, maybe I'll just teach them on what I'm seeing about the court of heaven. So I got up and I did the first session on the court of heaven. And then we took a break. And then I got up and I did the second session on the court of heaven. And I remember the lady, she said, she said, let's go to the green room. And so we started walking. And as we're walking to the green room, after I've done a couple of sessions, she looks at me. And I'll never forget it. She said, you make me feel like a fool. And I said, why? It brought tears to me. I said, why? She said, because you're, you're giving us language for what we've been doing for 20 years but couldn't explain. That's when I realized I got a hold of something. I got a hold of something. I now have, I don't even know, 20, 22 books on the courts of heaven that are out. I'm, I'm, talking, about, I'm talking full-fledged books, I mean, there's, and there's more that is coming out. The newest one, Mantles from the Courts of Heaven. I mean, it's just, just, it's just a theme that took over my life, and I suddenly began to realize God had mandated me to impregnate the body of Christ with this understanding because I began to learn more and more, and still am to this day, that when you step into the courts of heaven, you can bring a case. Now, let me just let me just explain to you this way. In the book of Luke, in the book of Luke, when Jesus is teaching on prayer, he puts prayer in three dimensions. In Luke 11, he gives us two. And in Luke 18, he picks up and gives us the third one. Remember, in Luke 11, 1, his disciples came and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven. And so his first thing was he taught them how to approach God as Father. And that is always the first beginning places of learning to pray. You have to have a revelation of who the Father is by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.15 says that, that the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of, do, of adoption creates a cry in our heart whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. In other words, we have a revelation of God as Father. And you will never go any deeper in prayer than your revelation of God as Father allows you to go. You have to know him as father. So many people never get that revelation. They see him as some hard, cruel, demanding God when he is a father. He is a benevolent father who loves us. I do tell people this. The cry he creates in our heart, the revelation he brings is he's Abba father. Abba is a term of endearment. Father is a term, term of authority. You see, in this day and age, the church is preaching a message of Abba, but they're not preaching the message of Father. He's Abba. He's Abba. He loves you. He'll forgive you. Yes, he does, and he will. But he's also Father. He's the God of authority, and, when he, and he will discipline us, according to Hebrews 12, when he needs to discipline us. He said, if you're without chastisement, you're not a real son or daughter. Because any real son or daughter is going to get disciplined. We're going we're gonna to get challenged at times. I've had the Lord, and I still have the Lord do this. And listen, being chastised, we got such a war view. Oh, he's going to chastise. Some terrible thing's going to happen. No. Chastisement is that, is that touch and, and that, that, that uh, realm where the Holy Spirit just says, uh -uh, don't do that. Don't write that on Facebook. Don't look at that picture. Don't involve yourself in that conversation. That's the discipline of God. That's not some, you know, terrible consequence happening in our life. But God will do that to us if we're really his sons and really his daughters. He'll do that because he's Abba Father. He's not only Daddy that loves us and, and we, can cry, we can climb up in his lap and, 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 and experience his endearing presence, but he's also Father. Okay, now watch what he said. But then Jesus continues in Luke 11 when he says, what you say, our Father which art in heaven, approaching God's Father. Then he says, and which of you having a friend? And begins to talk about approaching God as a friend. And he talks about uh, someone that comes to a friend at night on his journey. 
And he says, you know, I need some help. I don't have any. But the guy that he comes to doesn't have anything. So he gets up and goes to another friend. And it's a pic- And it's a, this other friend is clearly God. It's a picture of one friend standing between two friends. So watch, approaching God as friend is us approaching him in a place of intercession in behalf of someone else. When you approach him, I'm just, gonna, I'm just touching it. When you approach God as father, it's usually about your own needs. When you approach God as friend, it's about the needs of others that you're standing in behalf of. But then he leaves that with them. And Jesus then picks the subject back up in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. It says that he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not to grow weary or turn coward. And he begins to talk about a widow who comes before an unjust judge saying, avenge me of my adversary. Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But because this widow kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, presenting her case before this unjust judge, this unjust judge finally says, I'm going to give her what she wants, lest by her continual coming she wears me out. He said, hear what the unjust judge says. And will not God avenge his own elect who cry to him day and night? Yes, I say he will avenge them speedily. So watch. We approach God as father for our own needs. We approach God as friend in behalf of the needs of others. But you approach God as judge when you're dealing with an adversary. Okay, I'm going to explain that in just a moment. When you're dealing with an adversary. Because the whole message in this parable that Jesus told in Luke 18... It's not that God is an unjust judge we have to convince, but it's that if this widow could get a verdict from an unjust judge, how much more can we come before God, the judge of all, and see him render verdicts in our behalf? So he puts prayer in coming before God as judge. See, we know about approaching him as father. We might know about approaching him as friend. But we haven't known a whole lot about approaching him as judge. Because that's where you step into the courts of heaven. And the widow said, avenge me of my adversary. The word adversary is antidikos. In the Greek, it means one who brings a lawsuit. That would make sense. But it comes from two words. Anti, which means against or instead of. And dikos, which means rights. So the purpose of the adversary, which 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us who he is. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. Same word, antidikos, the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So it's the devil that's the adversary. He's the one that's seeking a lawsuit against us. Why is, he, why is he seeking the lawsuit? Because he's the anti He's He's standing against us or instead of, and he's, he's fighting against what's rightfully ours. How many people have you seen die before their time because they didn't get healed? When he belonged to them because of what Jesus did or live in poverty or have family breakup, all these kind of things. Why? Because the enemy has built a case against them, denying them what, what really does belong to them. You can never deal with that going before him as father or going before him as friend. You have to know how to approach him as judge. And step into the courts of heaven and present a case before him, just like the widow did, and see a verdict rendered. Because I promise you, once a verdict is rendered, remember again, Daniel 7, 26, the court is seated and they render a verdict that takes away his his dominion in an instant. One verdict from the court move the people from a place of absolute defeat to a place of complete dominion. How many of you think I might need a verdict from the court of heaven? 
Because that's what I got in South Africa in that initial thing. I got a verdict out of the court because I answered the accusation that was against me by the blood of Jesus. And all of a sudden, everything shifted and everything changed. Because guess what? I came home. All of my kids, they didn't have a clue what I had done. They began to, to snap into divine order. Now, four, all, all, uh, uh, five of the six of my children are in full-time ministry. And my other son is a very sick successful business person. That was not what was going on before the court of heaven. They were a mess. But everything shifted because the accusation against me coming from the bloodline was completely revoked and removed and a judgment was rendered in my behalf. I just want to tell you something. It's really good for us to be here. Because some of you know we just went through Rosh Hashanah and we're heading toward Yom Kippur. Now, do you know what that means? That means we're in the days of awe. We're in the days of awe. That's what it's called. It's the days of repentance where the, if there's anything wrong in my life or, or there's something wrong between me and somebody else, it's the time to get my heart right and to get it fixed. Because on Yom Kippur, this is what the Jews believe, your fate for the, this next year is determined. But guess what? Daniel 7, verse 10, it says the court is seated and the books are open. Listen, we can, as New Testament believers, we all have access before the courts because that's why Jesus put prayer in a judicial system in Luke 18. But listen, on Yom Kippur, during these, these uh, Rosh Hashanah and, and the days of awe and Yom Kippur, these are the days when the court is seated, ready to hear cases, and the books are open. This is a very significant time to be approaching the courts of heaven. So it's really good for us to be here during these, this, this time. Because I have watched God in this season. And listen, I'm not, a big, I'm not a big Jewish guy. What I mean by that? I mean, I don't get caught up in all the trappings and all that kind of stuff. But I've, I've seen it happen too much where during this season of time, significant things, significant renderings from the court would be made in my behalf. And judgments would come that would, that would cut off everything that was against me so that I could come into the new realms that God had before. It's really significant for us to be here in this time. We can take advantage of it. So here's what I want to do. I want to talk to you about how to present a case in the courts of heaven. You ready for this? I'm going to show you how to do some of this. And listen, I've got, if, if, if somebody's got 20-something books on the subject, all we're going to do is scratch the surface. Okay, but I can give you some principles that can help you know how to come before the courts of heaven. I mean, my, um, like, like, like he said, my whole prayer life changed. My, I, I now, when I come into the courts, I come from a legal perspective. Because guess what? Well, I get to this in just a moment. Do you know that everything that Jesus did on the cross was legal? Do you know that the Holy Spirit moves on our lives based on the legal work of Jesus on the cross? That the Holy Spirit's job is to take what Jesus has legally done and to bring the reality of that into our life. So many times I'll just come before the courts and say, I, Lord, I remind you of what Jesus has done. I'm asking on the basis of what Jesus has done that the Holy Spirit would come now and bring breakthrough in my life because of his legal work in my behalf. So we're going to talk about that. So let me give you... Seven ways to present a case in the court of heaven. I'm going to move through them pretty quick. And I realize for many of you, it's the first time you're hearing this. For some of you, it's a re, it's, it may be a review, but there'll be some, there's new stuff here that I want you to hear. And, and some of this is going to make sense. Some of it's going to, it's going to, uh, you know, prick your interest. And by the way, I'm sorry, my books, I just, I, they didn't get here. There's a reason behind that. Uh, you can go to roberthenderson.org. That's the best way you remember my name. rgpec.world. But roberthenderson.org and all the books are there. And uh, they'll be taking orders at the back too. Um, and then we'll get them shipped to you. Okay, so let me give you seven ways to present cases in the courts. Number one, 
put God in remembrance. Everybody say, put God in remembrance. Isaiah 43, 26. Here's what God said. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. So every time you read in the Bible, where, where for like, like for instance, Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, remember me, O God. What's he doing? He's appealing to God as judge. He's saying, remember me, O God, for the good that I have done. Remember me, O God, for my obedience to your word. Remember me, O God, for the offerings that I've given. Rem all of this is biblical. Remember me, O God. What are we doing? We are calling God into remembrance because we're actually stating a case before his courts and asking for a righteous judgment in our behalf. He said, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case. Well, now, let me just say this. When it says, let us contend together, it's not God contending against me and me against God. It's me and God together contending because the word contend there literally means to judge. It's saying, let us together judge. Let us judge that thing that is illegal, is unrighteous, that shouldn't be going on. Let me stand, not just as a defendant in your court, but as a judge in your court. That's another old subject. So that I can be a part of rendering a judgment that sets things in divine order in this earth. We have a right to do that. I could tell you testimonies. But the first thing you need to know, call God to remembrance. Second thing is understand books of destiny. Daniel 7, verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The court was seated. What does that mean? It's ready to hear cases. And the books were open. See, the Bible says, well, watch, and you got to get this. The court of heaven is not a place you bring your need. The court of heaven is where you petition the Lord based on his purpose. Because what's in these books that are being opened is the books of destiny, the books filled with the purposes of God concerning our life. You see, one of our problems is we make it about us when if you would learn to make it about him, it would move things in the spirit world. Oh, God, please, my kids, their own drugs, please. No, how about, God, if you don't do something, you're going to lose your purpose in these kids. Make it about God. Quit whining about yourself. Everything will shift. I'm learning. I'd like to say I've learned, but I'm learning how to approach him based on what's written in his book. Because we still think it's about us. All things are for him, by him, through him. It's all about him. It's not about us. It's about his will in the earth. Does God love us? Absolutely. But if we can learn to appeal to his court, you listen, you can come to God as father for your stuff. You can come to God as friend for the stuff of others. But when you come into the courts, if you'll make it about his will, his purpose, his passion, it'll release his hand in your behalf. They have made, like David learned to do this, they have made void your law. Arise, O God. Are y'all hearing me? So, so we come before him and we declare from the books of destiny. What does that mean? You're going to have to have some prophetic insight in what's written in a book. See, Psalms 139, 16. Your eyes saw my substance being yet informed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. I love that scripture. That scripture had always intrigued me. When I found out the court of heaven and I saw that the court was seated and the books were open, I figured out why it didn't intrigue me. Because every one of us has a book in heaven that chronicles the reason you are alive in the earth. That chronicles your kingdom purpose in the earth and actually how many days are allotted to you to fulfill that kingdom purpose. 
So what am I doing? When the court is seated and the books are open, I come and I say, Lord, you called me to this. This is what's in my book. You said to me, you will disciple nations. So I began to present that in the courts of heaven. If you'll discern what's in your book and you'll know why you exist in the earth as far as God's purposes are concerned, you can begin to petition the court and God will hear you. Because we all have a book of destiny written. If, I mean, if you search it out, it was, it was written before time began. God didn't get up this morning, number one, because he doesn't go to sleep. But secondly, he didn't, he didn't just decide today that he was going to do this. And, no, the Bible literally teaches that before time again, before there were sun, moon, stars, anything that creates time, God already thought you up and made plans about you and wrote them down in a book. And when you came into the earth, you didn't come into the earth to create your destiny. You came into the earth to discover it. And then you began to present it. Because we began to realize, I knew there was a reason I felt like there was something I needed to accomplish that I haven't been able to accomplish. See, you began to call God into remembrance of what's written in your book. That's why the court is seated and the books are open. Because, because cases are presented out of the open books. Okay, number three. You present cases from prophetic words that have been received. Anybody ever got a prophecy here? Or a prophecy? I saw prophecies over Alabama from Ruth Ward Heflin and, and Dutch Sheets. Well, guess what? All of us have prophecies. I mean, maybe they're prophecies you heard in your own prayer time. Maybe there's things that you heard God say about you. Or maybe someone prophesied to you. But listen, you need to take those prophecies and bring them into the court of heaven. Because I don't have time to go into this, but Isaiah 29, 11 through 12, 10 through 12 actually, it says that the prophets couldn't see and the seers were not able to perceive because the books were sealed. Listen. Prophets can only prophesy out of open books. So when books are open, now, they can prophesy the history. They might even prophesy the present, but they cannot prophesy the future unless books are open. And that's a whole other subject on how to get books open that I, that I teach on in, in a lot of my stuff. So because knowing how to get the books open so that we can receive those prophetic words. So, so when we, once we receive a prophetic word, what do I do with that? Well, 1 Timothy 1.18 says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage a good warfare. So notice what he's saying here. He's saying you're going to have to fight and contend for every prophetic word to become a reality. Why is that? Because once a true prophetic word comes over you, here's what happens. The enemy rises up in the courts as the accuser, the adversary that we read about, and he says, but I have evidence that says why they can't have that word. How many of you ever watched your life fall to pieces after you got a prophetic word when you thought it was going to go the other way? It's because the enemy is contending in the courts against you. So what? You go into the courts and you begin to repent for any accusation he is bringing. You ask for the blood to speak so that every case he is bringing that would disqualify you from that word is silenced and removed so that you can now have the word that God promised you. Because you're looking at a guy that lived his life in absolute frustration for 20 years because I could never get into the fullness of what God had promised me. And I knew God had promised me stuff. But when I discovered the courts, I thought, it's because the enemy has a legal case. If I can silence that case by the blood before his courts, then I can get the fullness of what he promised me. Here's what else I do. When I get a prophetic word, 
I call God into remembrance of the prophet that gave me that word. I drop names in heaven. You say, why would you do that? Because if they're a real prophet, they, care, they have a status in heaven. And their name carries a status in heaven. So I call heaven into remembrance of the prophet that spoke that word. For instance, I had a prophet friend named Dennis Goldsworthy Davis. They started prophesying to me that God was going to pay my house off. So what did I do? I took that word and I said, Lord, your prophet, not my friend, your prophet, Dennis Goldsworthy Davis, declared prophetically that you were going to pay my house off. In a matter of six months, that house was paid for. Because I kept reminding the courts of heaven about what had been prophesied. And the one who had prophesied it. See, most of you don't do that with your prophetic words. You either forget them or lay them up on a shelf somewhere. The Bible said you have to contend for them to be a reality. That means you're contending against a spiritual power that is seeking to stop you from coming into the fullness of that word. Number four, how else do you present a case in the courts? By reminding God of Jesus' work for us. I love to do this. Isaiah 53, four through five. Surely he has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows, which means He's borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. So what, what, we, we know that's talking about what Jesus was going to do on the cross that Isaiah was, was seeing. Well, guess what we do? Here's what I do. I come into the courts of heaven, and I remind you, Father, I remind you, I remind this court of all that Jesus has legally done for me, and I ask, Holy Spirit, that you take the legal work of Jesus on the cross for me, and you apply it into my life. When I first started seeing this, I was praying with a lady because her daughter had gone in for a very simple procedure, but she had had an allergic reaction to the anesthesia, and she had ended up in ICU in peril and in danger of her life. And so I'm on the phone, and I hear the Lord say, I said, I said to her, I said, Roxanne, let me pray for her. And as I said that, I heard the Lord say, remind me of what I did for her on the cross. That's what he's told me to do. And so I said, Lord, as I come before your courts in behalf of this girl, I remind you that when you died on the cross, you carried away our sicknesses and you bore away our pains. I am therefore asking, because you have legally done that, that the Holy Spirit would now take that which you have legally done and bring it into reality. I appeal to your courts in behalf of this. By the next day, she was out of the ICU and gone home. Because I found out, underneath the leadership of the Spirit, how to call God into remembrance of everything His Son did for us. It's all legal work. We could talk about that all night long. Number five, present the promises of God in the courts concerning you. Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in Him are yes and Amen. Or, or in him, yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So, so Paul said, look, the promises of God are for us. They're toward us. So maybe God speaks a word to you. Or maybe you just remember it. Call him into remembrance. Lord, I remind you. I mean, one of the things I do every day, Lord, I remind you that your word declares in Psalms 91 that you give your angels charge over us. To bear us up in their hands, lest we would dash our feet against the stone. I remind your courts of your promise, and I ask that no harm can come close to us. I decree from your courts that we, as the righteous, run into the, into the name of the Lord, and we are safe. We are untouchable. We cannot be touched by any evil or harmful thing because of the promise of your word. I remind your courts of this right now, and I ask you for a righteous judgment and every evil in intent of the devil that he would seek to do. I say it is, it is, it is revoked, it is fr frustrated, it is removed in Jesus' name. 
And you begin to appeal to the court of heaven based on the promise of his word. Number six, we need to learn how to make statements in the court. The Holy Spirit will tell you how to make statements. Number 16 and verse 15 is a scripture I want to say. I was in a hotel room. There was delay. There had been some things that had been promised. And there was a delay. And I couldn't, and, I, and there was nothing I could do to make it happen. And because I had 20 years of delay, anytime things seem to be delaying, I get real nervous. And so I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, is there something still speaking against me in your courts? And he said, yes, there is. Clear as a bell. He said, I need you to come before my courts and make this statement that Moses made in number 1615. He told me to do this. Then Moses was very angry because Korah was what they were doing and said to the Lord, do not respect their offerings. Watch, I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt them. So I knew the Lord was saying, they're bringing an accusation that you've taken something that is not yours. I need for you, this is what he told me, I need for you to come and make this statement in my courts. Because when you do, it's going to give me the right to examine the books of heaven to see if what you're telling me is correct or not. Because everything is written down in the books. So I came before the Lord. I said, Lord, I've taken nothing from them, not even a donkey. And I knew that instantly God was allowed to look into the books because of my statement. And as he looked into the books, he found that what I was saying was true. So the words that were against me were absolutely silenced and removed. And there was no more case. I got up and I, and, and I knew something had shifted. Because I had done exactly what the Lord told me to do. Listen, one of the best ways of function in the courts is underneath the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He is the parakletos, which among other things means he is our legal aid. He will tell you exactly what you need to say in the courts. This is what happened with Jesus. People think when he was doodling in the dirt when the woman caught in adultery was in a court setting and they were going to stone her. Oh, he wrote their name. No, he didn't. He simply was waiting for God to give him the answer. And he said in that court setting, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And everybody got convicted and left. Because God gave him the words to say in a court setting. So he told me, he said, say these words. It shifted everything. I'm waiting on these breakthroughs to come. So I go home the next day or so after I've had that encounter in the, in the hotel room. And when I get home, I have a dream. And in my dream, this is crazy. In my dream, I'm standing before a guy, a huge ministry. If I was to call their name, everybody would know them. That quite honestly, I've never really known fully what I think about them. I know everybody applauds them. It was like, I don't know. But I'm standing before this person. Me and Mary, my wife, are standing there. And we're trying to make a decision on what we will give to that ministry. And Mary says, in the dream, let's give $100. And I say, no, let's give 1000 And when I say that, that's the whole dream. And I wake up and I realize, this is what I realize. I'm going to share with you the principle in just a minute. I realize that in the hotel room, I silenced the case against me. But God's saying, I need for you to sow a seed that's going to speak in your behalf before me. Because it's not just enough to, to silence what's against you. You need that to speak for you. And so I would meditate. Because I mean, a thousand dollars is a thousand dollars. So I thought all day long, is this really God? I mean, I had no reason to dream that. So I stay up. I mean, go about today. That night, Mary goes to bed, never goes to bed before me. But I, so I stay up. So I, I get the remote and I turn on the TV. We had direct TV at that time. And I'm going down and I get to where all the religious programming is. And as I'm going through it, there's that guy's name. And only because of the dream, I clicked on it. And when I clicked on it, it's him and one other guy. And here's what they're saying. 
we're asking you to give $1,000, but if you can't give $1,000, at least give a tithe of $100. And I thought, that's my dream. And I thought, so I went to the computer, found their website, and sent them $1,000. And as I sent it, I said, Lord, let this offering speak in my behalf before you. By 10 o'clock the next morning, what I had been waiting on for, for several months, I got a call that day, and the door I'd been waiting on completely opened, and my life changed forever. Do you know why? Because I silenced the case against me, but then I sowed a seed that allowed something to speak in my behalf. Let me show you this. So here's the principle. The, the seventh way, the seventh way you bring a case before the Lord is with your finances and your offering. Your finances and your offering. Let me show you. It's going to blow you away. Hebrews 7, 8. Here, mortal men receive tithes. Talking, and what he's talking about is the Levitical priesthood. Because he's contrasting the, the, the Levites versus the order of Melchizedek. So he says, here, mortal men are men that die, and then others take their place. The Levitical priesthood, they receive tithes. But there, he receives them. Jesus, our high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, there he receives our tithes, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. You ready for this? The word witness means to give a judicial testimony. So every time you bring your tithe and your offering, you are releasing a judicial testimony in the courts of heaven in your behalf. It says it witnesses that he lives. What does that mean? That means, watch this, that by your offering and your tithe, you are connecting to his present day life as an intercessor in your behalf. So when I bring my tithe, my offering, I say, Lord, this is speaking before your courts. May it connect me to everything you are presently doing in my behalf. Let it bear witness of me to you and move in my behalf. Let this be a testimony in your courts. Your money has a voice. It has a judicial voice. Let me show you another script. If that was the only one, maybe, maybe not. Let me show you another one. James 5, 1 through 4. Come now, you, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And the corrosion will be a witness, same word, testimony, against you, will eat your flesh like a fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your field, which you kept back by fraud, not the laborers, the wages, cry out. It cries out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. And because of the cry of the wages... And the cry of the reapers mixing together, God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release a verdict against every oppressive economic system that's holding people in poverty. Because your money that belongs to you has a witness. It is crying out. The wages are crying out for you. I like what one guy said. There's some other people that's got money that's supposed to be yours. They held it back in fraud. Somebody else has got your wealth. But it's crying out to the courts to come into your hands. Because money has a voice. Boy, when I learned this, it changed everything. It made me understand why offerings and tithes and all the things we why it works so powerfully because when we bring it speaking in the courts real quickly Matthew 5 23 through 25 therefore if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you leave your gift there before the altar and go your way first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift we'll pause right there it says, if I'm bringing my offering and I remember there's something wrong in my heart with somebody else, he said, don't bring it. Why? Because the state of your heart when you bring your offering is 
what is the, is the testimony that is connected to that offering. So he said, don't you bring an offering if you got bitter, angry, hate, whatever in your heart. Don't bring an offering. It's going to have the wrong sound. It's going to say the wrong thing in the spirit world. And the enemy is going to take advantage of it. How do I know that? The Bible says, agree with your adversary quickly. Adversary, one who brings a lawsuit. While you're on the way with him, lest the adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, you be thrown into prison. So watch what he's saying. He said, if you bring an offering with a wrong spirit, it has a wrong sound, and instead of it testifying in your behalf before the courts of heaven, the adversary grabs hold of it and uses it against you because of the wrong sound attached to it. I prayed with hundreds and thousands of people to silence the sound of previous offerings that were speaking wrong things into the spirit realm. Jesus said, don't do it. Watch. He said, leave it there. He said, don't use it as a reason not to give. Use it as a reason to go get things fixed and then give. And then the last one. The last thing, and I love this. I say this for last because this is so, if I could get the church to see this, we could shift things in this nation, in our cultures. Malachi 3, 2 through 5. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. Now, why is he taking them through this massive purifying process? It tells us that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. See, God says, look, I'm going to do such a deep work so that you bring your offering with the right heart and the right spirit. Okay, so so it's, out of a, it's out of a right devotion, out of a right faith, out of a right uh, a love and, and, and adoration of who God is. That they may be an off, bring an offering of righteousness. Watch what he says. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be, will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. Notice it. Here's the kicker. And I will come near you for judgment that I will come near it literally says to render a verdict I will be a swift witness God says against sorcerers against adulterers against perjurers against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me says the Lord of hosts God said if my people would let a work happen in their heart so that they can bring an offering in righteousness it will release a testimony before me as judge that I can agree with that testimony be a a swift witness in agreement with it and it would allow me to judge everything that's afflicting our societies. If the church would allow this to occur in us and through us, not only would our offerings speak in our behalf, it would speak in behalf of the cultures we are called to represent before the Lord. What's really, I'll judge sorcery. Wouldn't it be great if God judged witchcraft in this nation? He said, I'll judge adulterers. Wouldn't it be awesome if God judged sexual perversion in this nation? He said, I'll judge perjurers, liars, so that half, if not three quarters of D.C. would be emptied because they'd all be exposed. They're a bunch of liars. I'll judge perjurers. People that aren't telling the truth. He said, I'll judge those who exploit wage earners. There again, I'll judge oppressive economic systems. I'll judge that which is, is systemic and is holding people in poverty and they can't break out. What's it? He said, I'll judge those who turn away an alien. He said, I'll answer the questions concerning immigration. I'll cause you to understand and I'll set in order the whole issue of immigration and aliens wanting to come into the country. God said, I'll do that if my people will bring me an offering in righteousness. 
If we could get this across to the church, we could change the nation through our offerings because it would be speaking in behalf of us and the culture we represent. This is all about the courts of heaven. So here's what we want to do. We want to bring an offering tonight. I want to lead you in a prayer where that any case against you is removed. But then we're going to present our case. How many have some cases you want to bring before the Lord? Anybody in the room? Then guess what? We're going to present them. But then we're going to also bring an offering. Whatever God says to you, just like God said to me, bring $1,000. And it brought breakthrough into my life. That I am still reaping the benefits from the day. May, I, I don't want to tell, I just, it's on, we're on line, and, and I just don't want to tell you the whole thing. But, but the bottom line, it just brought great breakthrough. Things I'd been waiting. How many been waiting on some stuff you need to see move? Anybody? You need something in your family. You need to, listen, God will render a judgment in your behalf. Amen? So let me, let me just, I'm, I'm going to get, the, I'm gonna get the, the, the details here. As we bring our offering, checks to miracles happen. Cash, credit card, text to give, all those are ways to give. Okay, do we have envelopes? So I want, I want them to pass out the envelopes because here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen to the Lord. And I want you to prepare your offering. And then we're going to present our case, and then we're going to bring our offering, okay? So why don't we all stand up? You've been sitting long enough. Okay, we just want to, we just want to, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, you can sit and write the offering on. Whatever you need to do, if you need to sit down, but if you want to stand up, you're free to do that as well. They're going to pass these out, and we're just going to prepare to bring an offering. Listen, this is not just any offering. This is an offering that's speaking in behalf of you, your purpose, your destiny, your future, your family, whatever it is. Listen, some of, listen. if you're like me, you have felt what it feels like when you can't seem to get into what God called you to. Listen, a big part of my issue was being able to bring an offering that spoke before the Lord. So we want to just prepare ourselves to do this tonight. God may tell you to do something crazy. I mean, I'm telling you, when he said to bring $1,000, I mean, $1,000 is $1,000. Uh, miracles happen. Miracles happen. Uh, write the checks to miracles happen, and then the credit card things are there. It's right there on the, on the folder. Yeah. So we're going to prepare ourselves. Could, could I have someone come? Could you come? And I'm going to lead us to this prayer. I know for some of you, it's the first time you've heard on the courts of heaven, but I'm telling you, it changed my life. Changed my life. Continues to change my life. It's changed thousands upon thousands around the world. The first book I wrote, Operating in the Courts of Heaven, which is no longer in print. Now there's a second edition or new edition. That first one sold over a million copies around the world. I mean, because this thing just resonated with people across the nations. And so, so I'm just saying it's a viable principle that we want to step into tonight. Okay. So as you're getting yourself prepared, when you're ready, I want you just to stand up. Okay. Because we're going to, we're going to just, um, make some decrees and request and petition the courts of heaven tonight. Okay. You're wonderful, Lord Jesus. You're glorious in all of your ways. Some of you, it's like you came to a, 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 a place where you've had some success and then it was like stoppage came. This offering before his courts is going to let him judge that thing and remove it out of the way. Lord Jesus wonderful Lamb of God and all of you online I want to encourage you to involve yourself 
in this offering because we're stepping into the courts. One, one of the things, Lord, he's given me a grace to move into this place. So we're about to make petitions before him. I want to encourage you to be a part of this offering through the online means or uh, credit cards or texting or joanhunter.org is where you can go online to give. I don't want you to miss this moment. Thank you, Jesus. Could you sing it? Can we sing it? Yes. you to say these words, Lord Jesus, as I come to stand before your courts, I ask, Lord, that you would hear the cry of my heart. Lord, you know all that's written in the books of heaven for me and all that concerns me. And I'm asking, Lord, for a fulfillment of everything that you wrote about me before time began. I put you into remembrance. I state my case. And I say, Lord, as I stand in your presence, remember me, O oh God. Remember me, O oh God, for good. Lord, I thank you for this. I remind you, Lord, of any and every prophetic word that has been spoken over my life. Lord, I say, even as Caleb declared, on the basis of the prophetic word that Moses had given him, I want my mountain. Give me my mountain. Lord, I'm asking that your name might be exalted. And your name might be glorified. That even, Lord, as you fulfill all that you have promised me, that it would be to you, Lord, for a name, for an everlasting sign that will not be cut off. That you, Lord, would judge everything illegal and unrighteous that would seek to prohibit this word from coming to pass. I call you, Lord, into remembrance of all that Jesus has done for me. That when he died on the cross, he judged sickness, disease, as illegal he judged poverty as illegal he judged mental illness as illegal he he set in motion everything that was necessary concerning life and godliness to be mine i'm asking you lord based on what you have done on the cross that all your promises would be yes and amen into my life. Lord, I also stand before you 
and any statements you need me to make before your courts, I would make them that this day. That it would allow you, Lord, to examine the books of heaven and to render judgments in my behalf. Now, just for a moment before I lead us in the last part, any specific thing you want to just whisper to the Lord right now, that, Lord, you would hear me and you would do this for me. That you would do this for me, Lord. That you would do this for me, Lord. That you would do this for me, Lord. That I would see the fullness of it. I ask for judgment, righteous judgments into these matters, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For divine order to come. Divine purposes to be served. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now just say this. Lord, as I hold this offering in my hand, your word declares that my money releases testimony. I declare, I connect to your intercessory work in my behalf. I decree this, Lord. As I bring this offering, I say anything that is holding back what belongs to me, what has been apportioned to me, any unrighteous thing that's keeping money out of my hands or breakthroughs in my life, I'm asking, let this offering speak in my behalf. As I hold this offering in my hand, I ask there would be no unrighteousness in my heart. I forgive any and all who have wounded me, who have hurt me. I release them. I say, Lord, let the right testimony be attached to this offering. And Lord, any offering I might have brought in times gone by that had a wrong testimony because of a, some wrongness in my heart. I'm asking that that sound in the spirit world would be annulled and no longer able to speak against me. Let the blood of Jesus speak for me. Forgive me for harboring, Lord, any ill will, any unforgiveness, let it be silenced. But let this offering have the right fragrance attached to it. As I stand before you, Lord, I ask that this would be an offering of righteousness that would speak in your courts and let you render judgments that you, Lord, might be a swift witness to. Let everything that is afflicting my life right now and the purposes of God in my life, let that thing be judged as illegal be judged as unrighteous in the name of Jesus and let the fullness of all that you have promised now be mine Lord I'm asking as we stand as a corporate people that this offering would also speak and it would, it would speak in behalf of our culture and sorcery would be judged as illegal adultery and sexual perversion would be judged liars and perjurers would be exposed and would be judged oppressive economic systems would be judged lord immigration issues 
would be set in the divine place. Lord, I thank you that this offering has that power in behalf of myself, my family, my ministry, my business, but also, Lord, in behalf of our culture. Let it speak before you. Now just wave that offering before the Lord. It's a, it's a testimony before him. I thank you, Lord, for this, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Could we bring the buckets up here? Could we just, and I, I want the people just to bring the offering, if y'all don't mind. So let's just worship. If we, could, if we could do that again. And I want you just to come. I want you just to bring the offering. Then we're going to lift the offering up to the Lord. The heavens are open. And I see Jesus speak in your courts. They speak in your courts. It's, it's giving testimony before It's speaking before you. Is speaking before you, is speaking before you, Lord. And I see Jesus. Oh, the heavens are open. And I see the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. judgments. Just say that before him. Thank you for your righteous judgments. Your righteous judgments from your courts. Thank you, Lord. Lord, as we bring this offering before you, we pray, Lord, may it speak in your courts in behalf of every person that has brought the offering. May it speak before you, these and all that are online. Let, it, let the cry of it be heard and let verdicts be rendered in behalf of your people. Also, Lord, in behalf of the cultures that we represent before you, let your name be glorified and let your name be lifted up. Before I turn it back to Joan, I know I went a long time tonight, but she asked me to talk on the court of heaven. I got 20-something books. What did you expect me to do? <laughs> I know I went a long time. But listen, somebody, you got a back problem. You got a lower back problem. It's, it's, it's causing you great pain and difficulty. If that's you, just come stand here right quick, just real quickly. Just real quickly. We just decree. Even as they come, we just decree divine healing into that lower back, Lord. Divine healing into that lower back. Divine healing into that lower back. We decree, Lord, that every sickness and disease is illegal and unrighteous because of that which you are saying, even from your cross, Lord, that you declared, Lord, it's legal, it's illegal, and that's unrighteous. And so we declare the power of these things. These backs just made well. Backs made well backs made well. Fire of God. Fire of God. Fire of God upon you. Fire of God upon you. Power. I declare the healing presence of the Lord. Fire into the backs. Fire of God in the backs. Fire of God into the backs. Fire of God into the backs. Fire of God into the backs. Sukotara mamakata. Fire of 
fire of God into the backs in Jesus name fire of God into the backs in Jesus name touch fire of God fire of God into the backs thank you Lord the touch of God every back every back touch of his presence the fire of God fire of God upon you touch of his presence okay I want you to start to move twist come on we just receive the healing life of God we just receive the healing life of God we command every back made straight Every back made straight, every damage to any vertebrae or, or disc, oh God, or muscle or whatever. We declare it made well. We say, you're illegal, you're unrighteous, you have no right to stay. We revoke your right and we remove you out of the way in the name of Jesus. Come on, just begin to move. Jesus would say, take up your bed and walk. What did that mean? Step out of sickness and into wellness. Step out of sickness and into wellness. Okay, just begin to move. Bend, do what you couldn't do before. Anybody tell a difference? Anybody telling a difference? Who's saying yes? What's happening? It don't hurt anymore. What's been the problem? My, the disc in my lower back were not straight, and it, it just don't hurt anymore. How, how long has it been since it hurt? Or how long has it been hurting? It started this morning. Okay. So, but you had this problem. Okay, so move for me. Completely gone? Come on, give the Lord praise. Amen. Bless you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you and my wife said something one time. She said, she said, you know, I said, well, you know, this was it wasn't a great. Thank God for all the healings and all that. And I said, it wasn't anything great big. Mary said, not great big unless you have it. She said, when you got it, it is great big. They don't care what, how, how, you know, how much you think it is. So, Father, we just thank you for this. We just thank you. We just bless this offering. We say, let it speak before the courts of heaven and let your name be exalted. And, Father, even in the night season, let there be fresh new revelations of who you are and the empowerments of the Spirit, the healing life of God. Let it flow and let all that you would do tomorrow and throughout the weekend, let your name be great glorified and we thank you for it in Jesus name amen could you give the Lord a great big praise